Welcome Whitney Prue to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Doing well. Thanks so much for coming on. Today we're going to be having you on as a health coach. And this is what we need in our world. We need more people to be aware of their health. I was just thinking the other day, and we definitely can make this part of the conversation, that many people, they put their career because they're healthy, right? They get out of college, they're still young. They'll put their career first, they make all this money. And then later on in life, they spend all this money to get back their health. But it's just a mindset switch, just saying, hey, why not focus on our health and our career? We definitely could talk about that. But what is the world of health coaching to you? Why did you get into it? And how do you help people? Yeah, it's a big question. I never intended on being a health coach. I My big dream was always to be a pharmacist. That's what I wanted. That's what I was working towards. But when I was about nine months into my job as a pharmacist, I actually started to get an, an injury in my wrist. So it was like a tendonitis. I had a pain in my wrist. And I had worked so, so hard to get there to be able to work as a pharmacist. And then nine months in, it's like within, after feeling this pain within two weeks, I couldn't do my job anymore. So I thought, oh, you know, just let it heal. Like things are going to be okay. But what happened is I ended up being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. And within about two months from that time, I was uh, nearly bedridden. I, I was so fatigued, incredibly weak, a uh, lot of pain. I mean, I could barely get out of bed. I could like do one thing, one thing in a day. And if I needed to shower that day, that's like the one thing that I could do. And so I started to <laughs> get nervous of, you know, I had a $200,000 loan hanging over my head. And essentially, you know, I was scrambling of like, what do I, what do I do if, you know, I can't do my job anymore as a pharmacist. And so I was uh, pulling myself out of bed and trying to figure out, you know, what next, what do I do next? And I had always wanted to be a public speaker. That was for whatever reason, that was a dream of mine. And so I started going to Toastmasters and I remember my first Toastmasters, I was so sick. I was like in tears as I'm like pushing myself to get to the meeting. And it that was just the beginning, you know, of really diving into something new. And from there, that's kind of how I came across coaching and started, you know, getting my certifications and, and that type of thing. And so now, you know, I've, I've got a full fledged business, um, helping people every day to really prioritize their health, because I didn't, I, I prioritized my career, I prioritized pharmacy, I'll never really have the answer of whether or not my autoimmune disease was triggered because of that. But I want to make sure to help everybody else that they don't end up making, you know, those poor choices like I did and end up really losing a lot of their life and capabilities. And your story is of plight, but it seems to be a common story, a commonality between so many people. They have an issue or trauma, something happens in their life, and it's like they do a 180. They said, I have to change this. Like you were going full throttle in school to be a pharmacist, and then it's just like, okay, well, now I'm having these issues. What else can I do at that point? in your life, because I'm sure it can be very relatable to many people. What were some of the negative thoughts going on in your head? I mean, <laughs> it, it was tough. It, you know, it's like I was in a relationship. And at that time, my boyfriend, my fiance is like, do you really want to marry someone who all of a sudden is like bedridden, like can't, you know, can't do anything? Do you want to like commit your life to this? Right? It's like, now I don't have a life. Do you want to not have a life? <laughs> Essentially? So there was there was some of those thoughts. I've never really had like negative thoughts towards myself of like beating myself up. But the hardest part about going through all of that was essentially grieving the loss of my life. Like I, I couldn't do any of my hobbies. I couldn't do, you know, just regular. I couldn't even help around the house. Like I couldn't clean my house. I couldn't go to the grocery store. I couldn't cook. Couldn't even unload the dishwasher, right? Like all of those things. Like I couldn't even do those things. And so you have to start to wonder, like, do I want to, <laughs> you know, can I be a burden to this person for the rest of their life? How does this work? You know, it's just, it's just constant of like, how do I, how do I figure this out? How do we manage this? What does life look like? And, and gratefully, um, my husband stuck with me. There is an aspect to health, the physical, the mental, and maybe like the nutritional. We can go down any avenue you want. Which one would you like to go down? 
No. <laughs> I'd let you pick. My my big thing is actually the mental health. Um, mental. I mean, the, the mental health aspect in relation to physical health, right? Like the, mm-hmm. the majority of people come to me because they want to lose weight. They get to the point, like I did, where it's like, crap, something's happening with my health and I need to do something. Mm. And it's usually that they've started gaining weight, their cholesterol is high, their blood pressure is high, they've been diagnosed with diabetes, whatever. And then they're like, okay, now I have to do something. I need to do something about this. And so that's usually when people come to me. But I sincerely believe that if we don't actually address the underlying causes of why we ended up there in the first place, we're never actually going to get long-term results. So it's like people come to me for physical health. And then I say, that's cool. We'll help you there. But there's this other piece that's that's missing. It's missing in the weight loss industry. It's missing in the diet industry. And we have to address the mental and emotional barriers or we're never going to be successful long term. I 100% agree with that. It's the same thing in mindset where people will come to me saying they want to be a better husband or wife or they want to be an all-star sports person in, in college. And I say, okay, well, we have to build that person first. We have to look at some of the issues that are stopping you from being that person currently, and then we can be that person. Yeah. I think people think it's like a magic pill. It's just like, all right, give me the good stuff so I'm automatically perfect and fixed. But it is going to be, we have to go through that dirty laundry, per se, yeah. or those, uh, you know, the baggage in the closet that we've been throwing away. And sometimes we do that by just ignoring, by not putting some awareness and some attention. How can people start to create some more awareness to their health, be it mental? The big thing that I start to tell people, I mean, a lot of people that I start to talk to, they they don't actually realize that that they're doing what they're doing. It's it's a lot of it's really subconscious. And so the biggest step in the beginning is is increasing your awareness, starting to ask yourself questions like, why am I actually doing this? Why am I here? noticing things that are uncomfortable. One of the biggest things with with the people that I work with when they're trying to work on their health and they're like, I have, you know, I've, I, I'm an emotional eater or a stress eater or, you know, it's like these things that I just absolutely can't control. The majority of people are using food to cope in some way, right? They're, they've been through something in life. They have a challenge. They have something. There's a need inside of them that's not being met. And they're trying to meet that need with food. And however many years they've done it, right, it just feels normal to them, but it's not normal. The majority of people that I actually work with, a lot of it is that we actually don't know how to meet our own needs. So a lot of times I start with uh, with people, I'll have them start asking three questions whenever they're hungry. You know, it's like maybe they're sitting on the couch, they're not doing anything, and they want to go get a snack. They have like this this craving or this trigger of like, okay, it's food time. And I always tell them to ask three questions. Number one, am I hungry? If you're hungry, you should eat and preferably a healthy snack, right? Question two is if you're not hungry, then you ask yourself the question, why am I going to food right now? Right? So we start asking ourselves, why am I stressed? Am I emotional? Am I upset about something? Am I bored? And I don't like the stillness of me just being with myself is uncomfortable, right? There's a million reasons and everyone's is different. So start asking yourself why, like, why am I going to food right now? What is, what is the cause? And the third question that I have people ask themselves is what do I really need? Because if you're going to food and you're not hungry, you're likely trying to meet a need is not actually going to be met with food. You're going to cover it up for a little bit you're not actually going to meet the need. So what do you really need? Do you need support? Do you need love? Do you need, you know, to do this work to really turn inside and learn how to show up for yourself, learn how to be an emotional support, to be your number one fan, right? And the majority of people don't know how to do that. It's a scary place for most people to go inside of themselves and just be content, like being with themselves. And that's usually where most people need to go. It's... Two different areas, I mean, we can look at, right? Because if we look at the issues with health, it's running rampant. It's not just a few people who have it. And so we do have to rise or raise the question, is this a societal issue or is this a personal issue that many people are just facing all at once? All of the above. 
Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, I mean, there's a, there's a lot from our society, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in terms of like mental stress and our ability to be able to cope with mental stress is becoming more challenging. COVID caused a lot of mental and emotional stress. A lot of people did not know how to deal with that. But we we live in kind of a even, you know, now with with inflation and different things like that, like we kind of live in this volatile, uncertain world. Like we don't really know when the next big thing is going to happen that's going to rock our world. And so I think that because of that, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of depression. A lot of people just don't don't know how to handle a lot of those things. Our society doesn't help right? Because we always have, and, and, it, and it never really has, we always have those expectations that we have this perfect body, that we, you know, all of those things. And, and that's what people are striving for. But then we have an incredible amount of unhealthy foods. When we go out to restaurants, our food that comes out is three times, uh, you know, it's like a serving size for the, for the average human. So there's there's so many different components, right? Where the mm -hmm. mental and emotional piece within our society is actually very challenging right now. And a lot of people are having a really hard time managing it. On the flip side, though, we have so much crap <laughs> available to us that once we start eating that way and our bodies start craving that type of food, it's really, really challenging to get out of it. And the portion sizes is just like over the last 20 years, you can look at how the portion sizes of just different foods have changed. Like we eat significantly more food today mm. than they ate on a normal basis 20 years ago. Yeah. And it's crazy because we are more inactive today than we were 20 years ago. Exactly. I remember being young, going out with my bike, riding around, my mom yelling at me, my grandma yelling at me to come inside and I'm getting bit by mosquitoes and I'm hanging out with all the kids on the block. That was life. That was fun for me. And then today, you just see so many children just stuck inside. And I mean, COVID definitely has a big role to play for that because so many people had to stay inside. I mean, they closed yeah. down parks, like kids couldn't even go to parks. And right. so they had to stay at home, do whatever they could, watch TV, play video games, and it became habitual, a habit. Yeah. And then we get into two conversations that you kind of brought up, circumstance and comfort. Because the circumstances, COVID, right? We don't know what's going to happen in the world. We don't know what type of health problems are going to arise. We don't know what's around the corner. But then comfort is going to be, I'm eating because it makes me feel good. Or I'm not taking action because I'm in that sense of homeostasis where I'm not that great, but I'm not that bad. Like if I could look around, there's other people who are worse than me. So I should be happy with what I got. When we start to look at health between comfort and circumstance, which is the crutch that's causing many people to stop their health journey from really flourishing? Both. Mm. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't know that you can pick one over the other. Okay. Unless circumstance is the one that's causing them to go to food, right? Then circumstance would be the underlying issue. Mm -hmm. And then they're using the food for, for the comfort, right? So it's like, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In, in many instances, probably the circumstance comes first. Okay. Um, and whether the circumstance is COVID or whether the circumstance is someone who's had parents their whole life who has ne who have never said anything nice to them. And so they have a terrible view of their body. They always think they're going to be a failure. They're always a disappointment. So why try? You know, that person, that's a part of circumstance. And they're very unaware of all of the things that actually happen and are, are occurring in the ways that they're trying to cope in their life to be able to just keep going to survive. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just, we don't realize how significantly our past and all of the things that we've been through actually are still impacting us today. I have a lot of people, I'll have people where, you know, they'll be interested in my program and I'll be on a phone call with them and I'll tell them about the mental and emotional piece. It's like, you have to address this piece if you really want to be successful long-term. And they're like, no way the past is in the past. I'm not going there. And that's the lie. That's the lie that they're telling themselves because the past is not in the past. If you have not processed those experiences, you haven't worked through them and addressed them and really gotten yourself to a healthy place to be able to release them and be able to, to work through them, they're still with you. They're deep inside of you. And at some point, it's going to erode. And many times, as those things are deep down inside of us, 
and we're not addressing them, we're trying to bury them, they over time start to manifest in our physical health. And that's how a lot of people are getting where they are is because over time, they have no idea that all of these things have built up over their lifetime. Nobody teaches us how to deal with them. And then they start developing unhealthy habits to try and cope. And that's where we end up with our unhealthy habits. You brought up a big question or alluded to it, at least the difference between therapy and health coaching, because Therapy has such a bad rap. I don't want to go talk to someone about my emotions and all my trauma mm-hmm. so they can judge me. And so it's automatically that self-defense mechanism popping up saying, I don't want anyone to judge me. I don't want to put my dirty laundry out there for people to see and to uh, speak about and to know and to understand. But there is an aspect to health coaching or just coaching in general that is very different than therapy. What's your take on it? I like to think of coaching and therapy as... Therapy goes backwards and coaching goes forwards. And what I mean by that is a lot of times in therapy, you're digging, right? You're digging through the crap. You're you're bringing yourself, maybe trying to relive the experiences, bringing yourself back to those. Coaching is more, I mean, we it, within my program, we do a little bit of that just because we need to figure out like what are the things that, that are causing you to do what you're doing, right? But we don't have to go, we don't have to dive in and relive them, right? With coaching, coaching is more, how do I empower myself to move forward? How do I envision this perfect world for myself, this perfect life? And how do I start building the goals and structure my life so that over time, I actually get to this vision that I'm hoping for? So I kind of think of them differently in in that regard. Therapy goes backwards, coaching goes forwards. The cool thing about coaching, like the coaching that I do, is I've put together 16 weeks of education in my program. So the part that's really cool is like, I mean, I've done plenty of therapy myself. There is nothing wrong with therapy and everyone should have a therapist in their back pocket. Like it's just essential because nobody's teaching us how, nobody is teaching us how to deal with these things and be healthy. So I really think it's an essential part of just living a healthy lifestyle. With my program and the education piece, you're actually really being educated on how your mind, how your mind works and why things are actually happening. And, you know, it's like walking you through a lot of steps. It's like, it's almost like walking you through this transformation. Whereas, you know, a lot of times in therapy, I feel like I'm talking things through and there is benefit to that, but no one's not as often. Am I getting like assignments or am I getting education where it's like, Hey, go learn how all of these things are working and why they're happening. And you know, this is how you can actually change your brain. And, you know, it's like that type of thing. So in a nutshell, that's what I say is the difference. Therapy goes backwards, coaching goes forward and upwards. Mm -hmm. And it's very different. I have clients that do both. They get a therapist and they also get a coach. And the reason is exactly what you said. As a coach, we're not looking at, oh, well, you know, like, tell me about your childhood oh, how did that make you feel? And asking those questions to go deeper into the conversation, deeper into your psyche. We're trying to see, okay, this happened to you, we understand, right? And then we can ask maybe a little bit more to know how they're feeling or how they felt. And then we can go with that. And then we can ask, well, how do you want to feel? Versus let's keep looking at how you felt. And it's important that as a coach looking at the forward process, we look at the end goal. The end goal for health can be very daunting for some people because they have so much work to do. Maybe they have a little bit extra weight they have to take off. Maybe they have a lot more traumas in their life they have to work through. Maybe they have circumstances that are going to be beyond your current world, societal circumstances. That is a lot for a person to navigate through. Where do they begin? Is it just like a three-step process? Is it let's just figure out what's the worst thing and begin there? Similar to like credit card debt, where you're like, oh, great, let's do the snowball method. Let's take the lowest one first, and then let's kind of build that momentum. How do we help people get back their health in that process? Starting small. Mm. One of the biggest mistakes that people make when, when they want to change their health is they think that one day they're living the way that they're living right now. And the next day they have to change everything and jump on board and go to the gym five days a week and change all of their eating and blah, 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 right? And it's just, anyone can do that for a couple of weeks, but only for a couple of weeks or maybe a month, but you're going to get overwhelmed. You're going to get exhausted. 
you're going to give up essentially. And that's where people go just on this cycle, right? A lot of, you can call it yo-yo dieting, where a lot of people will jump on board with this program, they'll lose a lot of weight, and then they just can't maintain it, or it's just not healthy. It's not even maintainable, right? And then they just end up right back where they started from. So it's just, you end up stuck in this never ending cycle, and people just, they don't know how to get out of it. They essentially get stuck. They just Mm -hmm. stay there. You know, there's no there there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, it's it's tough for them for sure because they have to see how far they have to go versus how yeah. far they have come because that is all they can think about. Yeah. Now we can shift that gradually with progress, right? So I love to take pictures like when I help people with health and fitness. We take a picture day one, and then in three months we look. I say, look at the progress you made. That is great. And then right there, we give them the positive to look at versus like, oh, man, I got to lose 50 more pounds or something like that, because that could be so daunting. As you said, you know, people can start starting is not the hard part. It's remaining consistent. That is where coaching comes in, right? Because if you have someone that's going to hold you accountable, it's like Whitney's here to help me. She's here to answer any questions. She's here to maybe reaffirm my confidence. And that is important for people because when they try to go alone, they're going to be fighting themselves so often. And we are our biggest enemies. We create all the obstacles in our life. We have to begin to change that. You said something about the yo-yo dieting. If not dieting, then what? Is there a better term to use for people who are trying to maybe lose weight or maybe just get into a better sense of health? What is the term for that? Healthy eating. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So what I, what I do in my program, because so when people come into my program, right, they're still coming to lose weight and people might call that dieting still. I don't like to call it dieting. I call it creating a healthy lifestyle. So essentially what we do is, yeah, we might give somebody a cal, we give people a calorie goal, right? This Mm -hmm. is what puts you into a deficit. This is what's going to allow your body to actually burn the fat, right? But the way that we do our nutrition is we we help people to learn what we'll give them basically markers of like, okay, this is how much protein you want to try to have. This is how many carbs this is how many fats. And then you know, they start tracking and they start eating. And they start learning and becoming more aware of like, holy crap, like, look at, you know, it's like, look at what I'm actually eating, look how many calories, look how unhealthy this is, or look how unbalanced this is. And then they get to start making changes. It's like, okay, so if I make a healthy shift here and take this one out that's like super, super high in carbohydrates, then what happens, right? And so then they see it to start to kind of balance out. And then, you know, and then I'll look and it's like, maybe they're not quite getting the results they want. It's like, okay, we need to up our protein a little bit, you know? So they'll start working on upping their protein. And you can see that throughout this process, we're making small changes, And we're building slow and steady, we're building new habits, we're building a new lifestyle. So yeah, they might be eating in a deficit, right? But we don't restrict anything, because it's not realistic to restrict sugar for the rest of your life. Like you can never have ice cream again, like is completely unrealistic, right? It's not going to happen. So learning how to be able to be in control and fit those things in, you know, it's like, maybe I do want to have some ice cream tonight. Well, I might eat a little bit less at dinner and and save some of those calories so I can have my ice cream tonight. You don't want to do it every night, but you might do it one night. And that way you're not like, you're not waiting and having this craving build up until you're like, you like have this sabotage day, right? Where then once you have this sabotage day or people will call it like a cheat day, they lose all of their results because they just completely binge. But we we want to get you to a point where it's like you're just you're eating healthy, you've developed healthy habits, and you you know how to eat things in moderation, you know how to lose weight. And once you get to maintenance, like you know how to maintain, you just continue doing the same healthy habits that you're already doing. So really and truly, I don't look at what we do as as a diet. You said healthy eating as the answer. And yeah. that is definitely what we should be looking at. But is healthy eating the same thing as intuitive eating? Not necessarily. So there are aspects of intuitive eating that I certainly agree with. And and I work with people a little bit on intuitive eating in terms of like listening to your hunger and fullness cues, right? It's like Mm -hmm. your body, usually if your body is healthy, 
then you can listen to your body and it will tell you, you know, it's like, I, I'm hungry or, you know, I'm stuffed, whatever. But the problem, the, the, the big problem that I see with intuitive eating is a lot of times in, in the beginning of the journey that, you know, people start with, with intuitive eating is if you completely listen to your body, but you have conditioned your body to actually live in a really unhealthy way then your body is actually going to be telling you wrong because you've taught it wrong. Yes, intuitive eating works and and is good and you you want to be able to listen to your body. But sometimes in the beginning, you know, people will come to me and they're like, well, I don't eat breakfast and I don't eat lunch because that's just how I've always done it. I eat dinner and then I snack all evening long. And I'm like, yeah, so we need to make some changes here, right? So that's where actually we have to start teaching their body differently. We have to start teaching their body that actually it is going to get breakfast and it is going to get lunch. And if it gets hungry in between, we're actually going to give it a healthy snack. And then it is going to get dinner. And if you're hungry right before you go to bed, have another small healthy snack, right? So that your body knows exactly when it's going to get food and get enough food. And then once you've developed, you know, your, your body and your metabolism to function in a healthy way, then yeah, listen to it. (laughs) <laughs> but if you've messed it up, it's not going to be telling you correctly. Yeah, there's aspects of intuitive eating that are definitely not helpful for you getting into better health. But there are many good aspects to it to not denying yourself food when you're hungry. Like, like people will starve themselves like, oh, I can't right. eat. And that's really bad. If you're hungry, your body needs that energy is giving you the sign saying, hey, we need to eat. I mean, when I started to figure out my macros, everything changed because when you reach a certain age, your body just changes from when you were active in high school. And then now you're working maybe a very sedentary job. Most people are working from home now. So we're just not as active. And I went from sports to being a teacher. Now I don't really have much movement besides dancing with the kids and doing things along those lines, but it wasn't enough. My body was changing. So my diet had to change or the way I was eating had to change. And it's important that we learn all aspects of health and fitness because it's definitely a mental game. It could be a nutritional game and you have to figure out where you need some assistance in. And that is why I have Whitney on to help us understand that there's going to be different areas that we have to look into. And Whitney is an expert at helping people uncover the areas that they need help in to get to a better health. As we begin to wrap up, Whitney, I would love to get some final words from you and then for you to please tell the audience where they can find you. Yeah, for sure. So my, I mean, well, in terms of where you can find me, uh, Instagram, my handle is my whole and happy life. And that's also my website. So www.myholeandhappylife.com. In terms of, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about your health, the biggest thing, and you, you know, you want to make steps forward, you want to start improving. The biggest thing is to start small. Start making small, consistent steps. And if that means that the first step has to be a two-minute walk, then do a two-minute walk, right? That's not shameful. That's a step in the right direction. And then celebrate the fact that you did a two-minute walk. And then build it up to five minutes. And then build it up to 10 minutes. And then before you know it, you're going to be doing 30 minutes or an hour. And same thing with your food, right? Start incorporating small little things because when when you take small steps and when you essentially you're stacking habits, right? You're habit stacking. As you start to make these small changes, it's not really like you're jumping on something and then you either pass or fail, right? You're slowly making changes. You're building a new lifestyle. And if you can address it and approach it in that way of like finding out what things are actually going to work for you and being flexible with life and working through things in that way, that's how you're going to be successful long-term. It's not jumping on with a program that's going to make you change everything overnight. You're going to get overwhelmed. At the end of it, you're going to be like, finally, I just get to go back to doing what I was doing and you're going to lose all of your results. So you've got to, you've got to take small steps and you just need to be slow and steady and you will eventually get where you want to go. And it's the consistency part. You're right. Taking the small steps where you are. It might be a walk to the mailbox today, a walk to the corner store, the gas station, wherever that might be for you. It doesn't have to be getting a full-blown gym membership. I know many people around New Year's time, the gyms love it because everyone's signing up. All right. I need a gym membership in order to lose weight. And that is so far from the truth. You just have to be more deliberate in what you do. Give some intention 
I have found the best way to get things in life that you're almost always passively missing is to get a coach. And I think Whitney's going to be a great asset in anyone's corner. She's going to be there, as I said, to help guide you to better health and to create the lifestyle that you're looking for. I want to thank you so much, Whitney, for coming on, spending some time with us and talking about your work as a health coach. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for, you know, just your very like in-depth knowledge as a coach. I can definitely tell that you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, it, you definitely do. And just I thank you for, you know, a really good quality in-depth conversation. Of course. Thank you for the great conversation as well. Yeah.